Welcome to a special holiday edition of Matt Break Studio Live. Uh, my name is Mark Spencer. I'm here with Steve Martin, the usual suspects. And how are you doing tonight, Steve? Feeling very elfish. <laughs> we thought we'd be a little festive tonight. It's, it's getting close to the holidays. We're getting excited about that. And uh, we haven't been doing a live show for a little while, so uh, we are excited to be back. And we've got a regular weekly show every week, Mac Break Studio, which you can watch by going to iTunes uh, and looking for Mac Break Studio. But on our live show, we really focus more on just having a discussion about Final Cut Pro 10 related topics. And it's more of a question and answer kind of situation versus our weekly show where we're sort of giving little tips and tricks. And you can't ask questions. And you can't ask questions on that show, right? <laughs> yeah. We... <laughs> <laughs> but here you can. In fact, the whole purpose of the show is really to answer your questions as best that we can. To that end, over on the left uh, of the window that you're looking at is a place you have to sign in if you want to ask a question. So you need to just you know, set up an account and then you can ask a question. Your questions get voted up or down. If people see a question they want to see answered, they can click on it and vote it up or down. And on Steve's fancy little iPad mini, uh, we will see those questions and we will do our best to answer them. Um, also, if you are watching, actually you are, probably aren't watching on an iOS device, but if you'd like to watch on an iPad or an iPhone, there's a link that should be on this page where you're watching on your Mac right now. Um, also, I don't know if you guys can switch to my computer screen. I've got the link up here on my computer screen in this beautiful text edit window. Uh, J.MP slash PXC Live and then 2012, 1213, the date. So um, take a look at that. Hopefully it's on the web page too and you can watch from your iPad or your iPhone. And uh, that's kind of the setup. So um, to get started, I thought we'd talk a little bit about Oh, that's okay. Just offline projects. Oh, okay. Nobody's seen that right now. Okay. Um, so here we are in December, and it's been a busy year for, for Final Cut Pro 10. It sure has. So let's see, how many, you were doing a little research today. It's like, how many Final Cut versions yeah. have come out in the past I've year? I've got this. If you can uh, show my screen again here, I've got a list of all the Final Cut updates here since it first came out in June of 2011, where we had 10.0.0, 0.1, 10.2, 0 0.2. And in 2012, we have had five updates right. over the course of this year, right? Two, two of, well, three of, two of which were really major. There are a couple kind of bug fix versions, including right. this 10.0.7 that just came out last week. But sure. a lot of uh, big changes. Yeah, I mean, you can see that it looks like 10.03 was a major uh, enhancement with multicam and a 10 out of six, tons of workflow enhancements, and uh, some bug fixes in in between. Yep. And overall, it's the the app is getting more awesomer, more robust, more, more awesomer. robust, more awesomer. <laughs> yes, especially when running it on the right hardware. It's yes. pretty. Uh, it's pretty amazing. We're running a uh, Final Cut 10 off uh, Mark's uh, fancy Retina MacBook Pro, and what's really amazing is, and um, we've showed this on a few shows, how you can drop filters and plugins, you can play back red raw footage without right. like rendering it. It's, uh, you know, I've, I just come to, the, I've come to the determination that you, you know, run Final Cut in its proper environment, you really need, you really need the right hardware to run it. Yeah. But you're going to be frustrated otherwise. And newer IMAX, yeah, because I've had the same situation. I upgraded specifically because more of a 3D program and a rendering time issue. Right. But I was shocked at the performance difference. I was really shocked at the performance difference of Final Cut Pro 10 and Motion on newer hardware. And also, you, you have some newer IMAX um, in your office, yeah. and it screams on those as well. Yeah. But it makes a big difference. I mean, on, on older machines, there's, there's beach balling, and it's just, it's a different, Unpleasant experience. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, the more VRAM graphics, the more robust graphics card you can throw at it, the better. Yes. Um, you know, lots of RAM. Eight gigs is okay. Sixteen gigabytes is better. And uh, you know, I think it'll be. I don't think anything com comes close performance-wise. And especially now that uh, the the gr the rendering within Final Cut Pro is dependent on the graphics card, like Motion, right. they, they've kind of switched that on in 10.0.6. Right. So now the better graphics card you have, the better performance you're going to get out of it. And correct. And, and a lot of the rendering tasks now, like when you use the share menu, are handled by the graphics card. They're no longer handled uh, directly by the CPU. They're handled. They're off loaded to the graphics, and this again speeds things right. up. Um, when, when a 10 version 10 came out, it was you know it took a while to get a movie exported. Uh, yes. Now 
it's just uh, you know, there's hardly like no, orders no. of magnitude yeah. difference in, in, in the functionality of it. Yeah, and yeah. so between running on good hardware and all the pieces that have kind of come back in, you know, a lot of things that people were. Um, complaining about when it first came out and was kind of missing features they were used to have been dropping back in there one after another after another and in general they've been uh, very good implementations of you know multicam red workflow of mm -hmm. audio components right um, really pretty uh, pretty shocking improvements pretty shocking speed of, right. of updates yeah. so We'll see what happens. It certainly has impacted us as as you know part of our lives as trainers. Is there's been a lot of work updating <laughs> tutorials. <laughs> <laughs> yes, We're because still it, updating. Yep, st still still updating and working on uh, you know all of our our breadth of tutorials that they reflect the current UI. Because sometimes there's not necessarily feature change, but a button you know the inspector button change, yeah. and it's like it's got to look right. So um, other things that are going on. I know there's been a few, uh, a couple things this week in particular related to Final Cut Pro. Besides the fact that, you know, over the course of this year, uh, the app's been updated regularly, and there's been a lot of third-party activity. Yes, that's one of the things where I think you see again the, the the biggest uh, kind of the biggest movement is in the third-party plugin. If you go to like. Peter Wiggins site, you can see like he's kind of a uh, central repository of everything re regarding the relative to the whole plugin world. You can just see it's almost like there's a new plugin coming out all the time. And so just for people who may not know that, you're referring to um, fcp.co, right? And I'll bring yeah. up, I think I've got that site. Yeah, so fcp.co is a, sort of a, a site run by Peter Wiggins that's, that's dedicated to Final Cut and has a lot of good information right. about what's going on Final Cut. Wait. It's noisy down there. Oh, I think I might be. I mean, be tapping my little okay uh, buttons there. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, one thing that he mentioned is that happened this week is this product called Clip Exporter uh, that has been around for a little while that lets you export your your Final Cut project. You can either export it for After Effects, your whole timeline, or you can export your clips for for Nuke or Synthize. Has just become free. Yeah. So he's uh, published the application for free, which previously was what around eighty. U.S. dollars was around 80, 90 bucks, something like that. I think it was like 40 pounds. 40. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the translation is right now. The exchange rate. <laughs> I'm sorry. It? Well, you're an elf, and there's there's like there's little know, elf my, things my, going um, on. You know, like my elfish, elfish sense is detecting <laughs> annoyances under the table. Um, but he's going to be publishing, making a source code available, so it's going to be open source, so people can take it and make it better, presumably, right? So not only is it free, it's going to be further developed, hopefully. Okay. So Excellent. very interesting and worthwhile thing checking out. And the other thing we saw this week was this product called Event Manager X, and I've just, I just brought up the yeah, website here. This is pretty cool. It's a cool product, and, and it's really been upgraded uh, with some additional functionality. In fact, we did a MacBrick Studio. I'll bring up the actual app here. Yeah, I think we should talk about this a little bit because it really, one of the challenges as your project and event library balloons in size because Final Cut 10, as you know, will display every project, every event, and you can certainly uh, obscure them with folders and make them neat. But you know, every time you launch Final Cut, it's it's essentially you know presenting all this and, and loading data. it all right yeah. and loading it all. And it's really handy to to be able to quickly go through and say, I want this event to. To be hidden and this one to be revealed, this one to be hidden, this one revealed, and be able to do it without actually physically going to the finder and moving them around. Right. So um, my buddy uh, Philip Hodgetts in in uh, intelligence, got the crew at Intelligent Systems came up with this really great thing in Event Manager 10 that allows you to essentially go through a series of checkboxes and turn on or off the events that you that you it, want on. Or. It's beautifully simple. I mean, you can see it on the screen here. It basically does what you could do yourself which is simply moving projects out of the Final Cut Project Events folder. In fact, if we bring up the, I'll just bring up the Movies folder for my local events here. So we have a Final Cut Events folder here. And if you drag any of these events out, they won't show up in Final Cut. They won't load, they won't show up. So you can drag them. And honestly, I've been doing that for you know, a year and a half. And it's like, well, Event Manager is cool, but I just didn't bother really using it. But I've gotten so many events and projects now, and especially getting ready for these shows, I don't necessarily want to expose all my client projects and my client events. And it's gotten complicated to move all that stuff. Yeah. And especially this new update. So this is what Event Manager looks like. It just shows you your event library up top and your project library below. 
And exactly, you can just check to turn on and decide which which events you want to show and which projects that you want to show. I mean, it couldn't be simpler. Could, right, and so basically by checking them and then clicking, a, the, we have a little button at the bottom that says move events and projects, it'll just essentially under the, you know, without you doing anything, just kind of take your events and projects out of the event library and put them into a, put them into the a folder. folder called hidden. Yeah, yeah. It just rather than you finding them and dragging them, you just click a bunch of checkboxes. But the coolest thing about it is this thing called sets. I, Which is new in this version. This is new. This this version 1.3, um, I think it's 1.3, 1.2.1. It actually went to 1.2.1 today <laughs> yeah, because well, of a little thing we discovered there, right? Um, but this sets, the idea of sets is rather than, you know, you might want to, for instance, for the show, there's certain things I'd want to expose and we want to demo. Right. And instead of me going through and checking, turning all these on, turning these off, I can do that as a set. So I have a set called Mac Break Studio that I can switch to. Yeah. And for that set, I have certain events and projects turned on and off. Yeah. So I don't need to go through and do it manually every time. It saves that as a, as a state, yeah. basically. Choose that state and launch and you're good to go. Now, there was one little gotcha that we discovered with this, though. With true. That is very true. In fact, if you create a new set, so I'm going to create, I'll hit this little uh, pencil, and I'll, I'll create one called MBS Live. So I've got a new set, and let's say in this set, let's zoom in here, I want to turn on this event, this 10.0.6 voiceover event. Mm -hmm. Okay, now here's the gotcha. You think it's done, but if I go back to my current set, where is the current set? It's funny, it's not showing it anymore there. Um, but I go to another set and I go back to MBS Live, it turned it off again. So I turn it on, I leave, I come back, and it's not turned on anymore. Right. And the problem is when, when you do create a new set and you make your changes, you need to actually make it uh, lock those changes in or save those changes. So you can, you can just uncheck reopen Final Cut Pro 10 and choose move events and projects and it'll quit Final Cut Pro if it needs to, to right. do that, because it doesn't want to do that while it's running. And now, if I go back to um, MBS, and back to MBS Live, it's still checked. Right, okay, because so you actually kind of locked it in by actually moving the folder into the proper exactly. In folder. Exactly, okay. so let me just launch Final Cut Pro 10 in case, in case we need it there. So, right. So, it's very pretty, cool. Very, very cool, I mean, uh, and it's, it's all kinds of scenarios where you want to hide different events, reveal them, projects, and yeah. And it's only one hundred ninety nine dollars, so it's like I know one hundred ninety nine <laughs> is awesome. Kidding, it's five dollars. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's five dollars. I felt five, embarrassed that I had, that I hadn't bought it. So I, you know, I literally bought it today, and um, we were testing it this morning, right? And right. we found something. It wasn't working quite right, and I, I made a little movie of the issue, and I sent it over to um, the right. developer, right? And they responded within minutes, and they said, "Oh yeah, you found something." Uh, and then five minutes later, he said, we fixed it, and if you go under updates, it'll update. And I went in updates, and if it, they fixed I mean, it. it's like, it's, the, it's a brilliant thing about small developers, right? Yeah, they are very, they can move quickly. So that's, that's fantastic. It is. Um, so we have questions starting to come in. Excellent. And I'll, I'll get to this in a minute, but I just wanted to remind you that if you want to ask a question about Final Cut Pro 10, about Motion 5, uh, any, anything related, we'll, we'll do our best. Um, there's a place to sign in. I'm looking at here, sign in on the left there. Just sign in, you can ask any question you want, you can vote questions up or down, and uh, we will do our best to answer them. So, um, this question I have why here. Why is my media offline is my first question. Why is my media offline? So, okay, so <laughs> Steve's asking one. So, one thing I've noticed, this, this, this is good, because it's just honest issue that comes up. And you can show the screen, if you could switch to the screen here. Um, I have some offline media here. And um, I have so many projects and events scattered across, so many drives, and I didn't bring any of those drives with me. I just have the what's internal. Right. And some of these projects refer to events that I don't have loaded. For instance, here's this GoPro uh, project, and that, ah, this is loaded now. This is fine. It yeah. just took a minute to update. Final Cut if, in the project library won't necessarily. It'll show you all the thumbnails if it remembers, even right. though well, that's because it's writing thumbnail caches. In yeah, the it's looking at the cache. So this right. cache was offline before, mm -hmm. but now if I click it, it's online. So this is this uh, multicam thing. So, so actually, it tem went temporarily insane. Yeah. So now we're good. good. Those are back. Let's see if this one's back. Yeah, I think everything's back and good now. I just needed to turn on the correct events. And frankly, this is where event managers are so useful because rather than going into the finder and dragging stuff back and forth, I was just clicking things on and off in the event manager. Now I have a bunch of projects that are all 
yeah, all online and in good shape and a bunch of events. So um, hopefully we're, we're good to go with that. Excellent. So this question, it's actually a comment, I think, from Alex Gallner, a good friend, Alex. What Alex time, what 4D. time is it oh, where he lives? He, I think he's in the UK, and I think it's eight hours later, which makes it about two in the morning, something like that. Is that uh -huh. right, Alex? So <laughs> he says, Click, clip exporter can export timeline clips with handles for After Effects, exactly, right. instead of sending whole source clips. Maybe it'll be updated to export FC, FCPX timelines with used media only plus handles. Yeah. Yeah, well, what he's referring to is the fact that right now when you export, not export, when you do media management, when you're sending it stuff, it always sends the whole clip. It's not well, doing any trimming. Yeah, he, this, this product that we looked at, Clip Exporter, um, Right now, if you use it to send stuff to After like let's say right. you build a little edit and you mm -hmm. want to send it to After Effects, it just sends the timeline clip plus some handles. Right, right. But but not more than that, and potentially it could send your whole timeline. I don't know if it works with connected clips and retime clips and all those things. I haven't. I've downloaded it. That was just today. I mean, this literally came out free today. Um, but at the price, it's worth checking out, especially if you use After if you use Effects, After Effects or, or if you use Nuke, Nuke or Synthize. Some people are using Synthize to sync their audio rather than right. the built-in audio sync, which I generally find very pretty useful yeah. and works pretty well. So, um, so yeah, that's a couple of the big news things this week is this free thing, an event manager update. Uh, we've seen a slew of new plugins come out um, all over the place for Phonica Pro 10. Uh, anything in particular that, that you've seen that's interesting besides our own? Mm, no. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> this is, looks really interesting to me. I, I uh, I'd have to go look. I mean, one of the great pla one good place for you know plugins, of course, is a FX Factory because it seems to be the great kind of repository for um, Final Cut 10 plugins, Motion plugins, yes. After Effects yes. plugins. So, so Steve's talking about, and I actually don't have that up right now, but um, Noise Industries um, makes a product called no called FX Factory, which is basically a platform for delivering. Uh, plugins for for Final Cut, for Motion, for After Effects, for Premiere Pro, right, right for all of those different applications. And uh, full disclosure, we uh, we produce and sell two plugins, uh, Callouts and Optics, that is delivered on the FX Factory platform. And um, if you think about it; it's it's somewhat like that Event Manager 10 we just looked at, where you can just turn on and off plugins. Yeah, that you it's want. kind of interesting, because it takes a little getting used to, because it does the work for you. In fact, if I launch that application, FX Factory, um, here's what it looks like. And I, ha I currently have all of the other plugins turned off. And one, one thing people don't understand, if they, if they buy a plugin that uses FX Factory, they have to download this application. And by default, all of these trial mode plugins are turned on. And then they launch Final Cut Pro, and Final Cut Pro's browsers are just filled up. With they're the, loaded with all this stuff, and they're like, "I hate this." They don't, you know. They don't, and some of them like it because you get to try them all out and decide. But it's a little bit of overload. But you can go in here and um, turn. So I'll turn ours off too, just so you can see everything's turned off. So you can turn on and off the ones you want, right? And you can turn them like ours are actually purchased, but ones that are in trial mode, you turn them on, and it'll actually I purchased that one too. <laughs> um, yeah, so here, particle metrics is in trial mode. So then it's in trial mode. So now that I've checked that, once I launch Final Cut Pro, it'll be installed. But only the things that you want to be installed. And you can check, if you click on these, it'll give you a little more explanation about what they are. You can look at help and tutorials, and then decide, do I want to turn it on and look at it in Final Cut? Right. And see what, so it's an interesting way to manage. Now, some we got an email this week, uh, and this I think this is worth bringing up, because yeah. Uh, Effects Factory 4.0 um, now includes a uh, help button and a tutorial button directly below the viewer in Final Cut Pro. And once you bring it to see this, that, that's a good point. I, I think this is a, a point, really yeah. good thing to point out because um, it's going to come up. And um, well, he's going to go ahead and he's going to go ahead and load up. Uh, I'm whatever. just going to load a project, and I'm going to hit X to mark a mark a little frame here and. And go ahead and put on one of our I'll just, opt I'll, oh yeah, just call out I'll, or whatever. Call out. I'll, I'll just actually optics would probably be a little bit better for this. Um, so let's say I'm taking a picture of this scene. Or you're putting a scope on it because you're going to blow the balloon out of the sky. <laughs> no, maybe oh. not. That would be kind of uh, weird. Let's say, say I'm taking a picture. So there I'll you grab. Picture. That's good. I'll just one. All right. Okay. And let's zoom in a little bit. Okay. So this is yeah. it's a title, but it ends up being this effect. Now and see the buttons. <laughs> what button? 
Oh. Yeah, I do. I'm just going to move ah, this down a little bit. See? Yeah. Now, it's interesting. You have two buttons here. You have a watch tutorial and a help. Now, what's nice is previously to watch tutorials, you had to go to somebody's website to see the tutorials. Or you had to be in trial mode. Or trial mode, right. But now, you can click those buttons right there, and you'll see a movie, kind of a step-by-step. -step. And then there's also a help button that will actually give you steps. But one thing that we discovered relative to the, the retina display that's kind of important, yes. when you have an additional monitor connected, Yes. Some, so so some what point. happens is, as you already saw, when I, depending on how I said this up, have this set up, the buttons can overlap the video, and usually you can get rid of that just by resizing the window. But if you are on a Retina display, yeah. right, and you're like using this one, but you're using a second display, a second yeah, like display. this one, and you put your viewer on a second display, there's a, and and they say it's a Final Cut thing that Final Cut will display those at the Retina display resolution, which is huge on another monitor. Right. So all of a sudden those buttons get very big uh, and can overlap the video. So just something to watch out for. And right now there's no real solution. Well, you said the solution was don't put your viewer on the other display. The display. Make sure you have it on your retina yeah. display because the, yeah. all the, the buttons are actually uh, sized for retina resolution. So that yeah. the buttons are like, like this. Wait, no, they're like this big, the buttons. Right? Well, it wasn't quite that big. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't quite that big, right, right. but it's pretty big. Okay. Yeah, so um, uh, that's kind of the deal with that. So it's an interesting platform for developing uh, and for delivering plugins yeah. across multiple platforms. Right. And of course, the ones we do right now are uh, optics and callouts only work in Final Cut Pro 10. Right. Uh, they're not cross-platform because they depend on motion for uh, the engine for their functionality. Yeah. Right. So. Um, uh, we've been here all day. We've been busy recording new MacBreak Studio episodes. Right. And back in the in the regular studio. So if you if you watch our show, you'll you'll see us back in the real studio soon in a few weeks. Yeah, with the green screen. Yeah. A couple of other things. Do we have any new questions or because it's a um, I do not okay. have new questions. So guys, come on. No new questions. That's I just I got it in my ear. No new questions. So if you want something answered, uh, anything Final Cut related. Go ahead and ping us because this is your lucky night. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, usually we have a flood and now uh, I think it's maybe a little bit into the holiday season. But um, you said something else you wanted to hear. Yeah, one of the things that, one of the things that comes Good up job. is, um, oh, I, you I like the mouse. You like that. You like the I hate the trackpad. I, I actually, have to use like the mouse. The, I like the trackpad. It's nice. Um, so, so, you know, little things like, you know, how to, you know, get out a still image from, from a timeline. So let's say we want to go ahead and export a still. It's not, you know, we're getting emails from people like, well, how do you get a still? It's, it's not a, immediately it's, obvious oh, that's a how Darth to do Vader that. Balloon. That's just cool. Isn't that cool? Yeah. That's, so this is, uh, by the way, this is footage I shot just this past October um, in Albuquerque, New Mexico at the Balloon Festival, wow. which I want to get you out to because it's really fun. You, you have to get up at 3.30 in the morning, but um, you get to see these guys lift off in the dark. Uh, and it's, it's quite an amazing, amazing thing. That's one cool balloon. So I want to take a still image of that, all right? And I want to put it on the web or whatnot. Um, you know, we have a new share function, a new share menu in Final Cut, which you can access visa the this button over here on the toolbar, where you go to the file menu and you can do choose share, but there doesn't seem to be any way to create a still image. Well, that's because it's not part of the default share set that you see here, um, which is Facebook DVD. I don't know, this is Mark's just, uh, a set, but I'm gonna go add destination, and it's always gonna bring us to the destination window and, of and the And you could have gotten here another way, right? Yeah, I could have gotten I could have gotten there by preferences, command, comma, or, or, or this other guy over here. Or here, um, there's three ways to get there. Okay. But either way, you, you get to the destinations window to where, all right, well, I wanna add a still image. Well. Well, there it is right there, save current frame. And what's the current frame? It's the frame directly parked, directly under your playhead. Where the playhead is, yeah. Right. So you just need to add this to your a destination list. And you can put it up or down, and we'll go ahead and put it right there. And uh, then you can choose the type of still image you want to save, a TIFF, a PNG, uh, Photoshop. If you choose Photoshop, it'll actually create a Photoshop header, so that when you double click on the image, it'll actually launch Photoshop. It'll launch for Photoshop yeah. for you. So you'll get uh, the highest quality image with no compression, and then it'll launch Photoshop if you double click. Nice, so if, you, if you're planning to take that to do some compositing and add some stuff to it, that's, that's the right. thing to do. Now I typically like to even rename this, so I'll type in here, um, I'll type in here Photoshop, weird angle, okay, so Photoshop. And then um, a lot of times I'll wanna create 
a JPEG version as well for uploading to a server or web. Um, just drag it in a second time, and then this this one I'll go ahead and assign as a uh, JPEG image. And then in fact, I'll go ahead and double click in here. I'll call it a JPEG. JPEG. Okay. So I know they are now. I could, and we'll go ahead and close this for a minute now, I could access either of those via the share menu. You'll see. All right, so that, now they appear now right they in appear. that menu. There's Photoshop, there's JPEG. But what would be even better is if, you know, I wanted to create two of them at the same time, a JPEG and a high-res Photoshop version. Right. So um, I could simply, you know, go back to, actually, well, this time we'll hit, I'm going to use another like command comma, bring up preferences, and then, then i got to go to destination, right? Okay. So what I'm going to do is make what's called a bundle out of these two. And you, I'm going to command click to select them both, and then right click, and then choose a uh, new bundle from selection. It's going to put it in a bundle folder, and you can see there, there they are. And then I can then name this bundle something like uh, still uh, exports. And uh, now when I access the share menu, either in the file menu or from uh, the toolbar, let's go ahead and make sure I'm in the there we go. It's a focus issue. And I go ahead, and then there is my still export. So, so if you choose that now, it'll, it'll do both of those? It'll do both. In fact, okay. one way you know this is that um, you can see this little button here that's going to export a JPEG and a Photoshop. So there's two in there. That's so right. you could set up a bundle to do as many things as you wanted. Right. You can have a, the bundle could actually include a DVD, it could include a DVD export, it could include an iDevice export, whatever you want. It's just that I happen to make a bundle that's just still images. Okay. But th that's pretty cool, the whole bundle idea, because you can you can export the, like a full res version and, a, and one that, because I've been using this like to go straight to YouTube. Right. Or straight to Vimeo on a regular basis. Yeah. And it's just great, because it just, it puts it up there, it adds the metadata, so you don't have to go in and tag it, it tags it off for you. Yep. And you can choose to make it, I generally make my things unlisted on the first pass, well, it's usually client that's review stuff. That's the, the, I think that's the Does default, it default view. There? It defaults to, not unlisted, it defaults to private, which means nobody can see it well, that at private, all. Well, private, I can't even, I haven't figured out to use private on YouTube, because it's like only if you have their email address, or you put it in or something, so I've, I've given up on private. But unlisted is great, because it's just, you just, it's only people have a link. And it's true, they could share the link around, but usually my stuff is like, kind of semi-private, you know? It's really for a client. See, I like that, semi-private. Yeah, yeah. semi-private's good. It's good. It's just not going to get blasted everywhere. But I use it all the time for, and Vimeo too. Vimeo the same mm -hmm. way. Client reviews. Vimeo I like a little better. I think you do too, because it's not. We well, you know, you're not days. I mean, I'm, YouTube. I mean, Google's trying to change uh, YouTube's, you know, perception, but it's still to me a giant flea market. You know, yeah. You go there and it just feels like a flea market. Everything and they're trying to keep channels now. And I don't know. Vimeo's clean. It seems like it's the whole thing with Vimeo is it's definitely geared towards. Uh, people that are serious about movie making that want other filmmakers and other artists to comment, you know, then, yeah. you know. I get that impression too. It's, it's just higher end. It's not cluttered with all this stuff that's trying to get you to, to watch the rest of the channel and watch related videos and everything. Yeah. And I hear that Vimeo is going to be monetizing the content next yeah, year. Yeah. Apparently you're going to be able to start charging for, for videos that you put up there. I still have a problem that I cannot watch Vimeo videos on my, my phone. And maybe it's because I use Flipboard as my news digestion. You know, right. I go through Flipboard, there's a Vimeo video and it will not play no huh. matter what on my phone. But YouTube stuff seems to play just fine. Um, but I'm, I'm becoming a bigger and bigger Vimeo fan and using that a lot more often. So he, back to this is then I just go next and uh, I just, I could save them. It's gonna save them. All, it's gonna default to the name of the project. In this case, this is your project uh, for uh, the, the still images. So I can change oh, just the project name. Right, which is kind of handy because you know where the stills came from. And uh, it'll append it with the word Photoshop and JPEG. So I'm gonna just go click save and Final Cut will spit out two versions of the still images and they'll sit on the desktop. Put them on the desktop. Yeah. That's, there it goes. So yeah. there, they should be, uh, let's see, see how messy my desktop is here. No. But uh, oh, there they are. Okay. Yeah. And they should look identical, right? Yeah. They, um, if I just space bar and toggle through them. Yeah, one's JPEG yeah. and one's. And one's Photoshop. Yeah. But it's a high res JPEG yeah. too. Nice. So okay. It's kind of handy. So that's a, that's a cool tip. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Very good. Um, and we've been talking about a bunch of, we've got a bunch of new things coming up on MacBrick Studio. We've talked a little bit, because we've gone through a lot of the 10.0.6 
features. We have, still have a couple of shows coming up. We'll talk about a few more of those features. Uh, but then we're really diving into more kind of the details around sharing projects, how you can move projects, one thing. And that's a lot of things we get questioned about, especially, right, is right. being able to move your projects from one place to another, be able to take your projects on the road, be able to, how do you, you know, how do you deal with that? Well, yeah, a absolutely. And one of the ones, you know, I was just thinking about the, you know, the scrolling thing, how, and we'll go ahead and play this. This is a long time. I'm going to just make this play. Yeah, yeah, you may find it let's, useful. Let's have, let's have a, let's, I want to make sure they're showing what you're playing yeah. here. Yeah, okay, I'm just playing a little bit of the, uh, you know, the Bloom Festival stuff that Mark shot at three in the morning in New Mexico. And it's fairly long, and it's just playing. And notice the playhead just went away. Oh, where'd it go? Playhead's gone. Right. Yeah. Now if I hit press H, I can bring up the hand tool. And I can, uh, I can, I can, I can do this. You can I, chase it. I can, I can chase the playhead with the uh -huh. hand tool, and that might be nice if you know it's this, you know, if you need to kind of see where the playhead is and still kind of update your timeline. Yep. Uh, but what's also nice is like as you're watching it, oh, that needs to be color corrected. Press C. Oops. And that's yeah, it. and it selects the clip. And, and just, oh, you, I think you pressed V. I pressed V. Hey, you can disable a clip. <laughs> you can as disable you're and it. re enable it. So C will select a clip while yeah, it's playing. I see. C will okay. select a clip while it's playing. And, and the hand thing, I think also you can, if you just press and hold the H, then it doesn't switch to the hand tool. It just temporarily let go again. It goes back to the regular tool. Oh, that's nice. And that's kind of cool. Right. So C will then, of course, select the clip. And then we'll Shift Z work while it's playing. We'll, we can. So Shift Z will get show you the whole timeline while it's playing, right. and, That's option, right. and then you can zoom in while it's playing. Right. You just touch. You just tap C. Yeah. So I'm, I zoom in. While zoom it's in while it's playing. And then uh, you know the, the hand tool. Right. Now let's see. It's interesting as it's playing. Actually, it's kind of cool that you adds, can do that. You know, add a selection. What well, if I wanted to select two clips? Can I do Shift C? It's question. No. No. But what if you're watching it and you have, let's say you have a clip, let's go up to this so Albuquerque event. It turns on uh, cropping. <laughs> let's see if we have that event uh, in here. Because what we could, what if we had, let's say I have a, like a little thing selected with an endpoint, and what if this is playing, and while I'm watching this play, I want to add that. Well, if I do a connect edit while it's playing, yes, it'll connect it at that point. It's kind of cool. You know, I don't know if I, I, would, know. I would do that, but... It would be actually better if Apple just did the auto-scrolling. Like, I, like yeah, I, yeah. I, probably, I think so. But um, it is pretty least, amazing yeah. what you can do. And the other thing is just that you're playing all this, you know, without doing any rendering. Like, I have this 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 uh, promotional video of Delfina, mm -hmm. and uh, which is uh, my sister's restaurant. I did a little holiday video, all shot on the FS700. At how um, many frames a second? 400, 480 frames per second. You gotta so show, super you gotta slow motion. show the, the food. The, the, super slow motion. Yeah. And, um, this is pretty cool. You gotta see this. We this, can show a little bit of you it. You gotta show it. But the thing is, you'll notice there's red, there's not red, there's orange render bars, because this right. is just the footage, the native footage brought in. Okay, no transcoding, um, edited natively. I never rendered anything until I exported. I just never rendered. And I've got I've got color correction on these clips. What is the native format of that camera, by the way? Uh, Sony, I guess it's like an it's like an X X two sixty four type of right. codec. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got you can see I've got um, some flashes and stuff. I got some um, different kind of like uh, film burns and stuff. Yeah. Uh, let me move this over here. A little film burns and stuff. So let's. I'll play a little bit. The whole thing's only like two minutes long, so I'll play a little bit of it. You get a sense of it. And let me turn off the music because let me see if it's okay with the music. I don't know if you're going to hear the music on here or not. And uh, oh, you know what? This is a live show. I don't want to show this yet. This is not. Uh, <laughs> this is not out yet. I don't want to show this yet. I forgot that we're, <laughs> forgot we're doing a live show. This is not out yet. Did you show a piece of it? This is well. Maybe the okay. We'll show a, a little, a little tiny line. piece. A little tiny a little piece. It's so thing. cool. It's just so cool. It's it's been. It was so fun to shoot, and it's so fun. So we'll show a little tiny piece here. Um, and again, this camera shoots. It, one thing about this camera, um, it shoots actually up to. Uh, 960 frames per second, but you start losing re resolution. Right. And you even lose resolution at 480 frames per second. You lose half the vertical resolution. At 240, you get full 1920 by 1080. Uh, we went up to 480 because we're doing some very, uh, you know, we're doing a food fight in this sure. thing, and we really wanted to see it in slow motion. Right. If I were to do it again, I'd probably shoot a little slower, but it's great having this stuff because you can really, at 480 frames per second, um, 
you, you can slow down to 5% of the original speed and still get 30 to 24 frames in a second. And you don't even need the optical floor because there's so many frames there, no. there's no reason. At 5% of the speed, you have 24 frames in a second. Wow. So it's just, so, so here's a little example of um, some stuff in slow motion Why don't here. Let's put it full frame. Oh yeah, yeah, why not uh, really make it look a little better? Yeah. There we go. There we go. That's yeah. Way there we better. go. <laughs> <laughs> and then you know, I sped it up and slowed down. I did all the speeding up and slowing down within Final Cut, um, just using the retiming and uh, a little bit of color correction and stuff. And you can get some idea. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Well, this thing will be out in a couple of weeks, <laughs> uh, but I don't want to. I don't want to let the whole thing out of the bag quite yet um, because it's kind of a customer video. But, you know, really fun stuff and so easy to put together in Final Cut. You, know, you did this, all the retiming using the retime tool in Final Cut. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because if you, if you look at this, let's look at, zoom in on a clip for a minute here. So if I take a clip, select it, hit Command-R, um, we can see this is set right now at 178%. So it's not even slowed down to 100%. Right. So I could have made this even slower, but I was, you can see these markers, I was timing it to the music. Right. Um, the thing is, you know, with Final Cut, you really can't ramp the speed changes. So you've got 100% speed, or you've got 80 or 70. It's kind of chunks. Right. Um, in, in, in earlier versions of Final Cut, or in motion today, you can create speed ramps. So it, it, you know, it's going really fast, and then it, it, it eases into slowing down. Right. And that's what I really wanted to do here. Um, you didn't, you didn't try using like speed segments where you... Uh, but this, the thing is with the speed segments, so if you go to the speed segments... You gotta create a selection the first, speed, yeah. Well, it'll, it'll, the, the speed segment will go, um, it'll go down to zero. Oh, it has to be the selection. Yeah, you gotta make All right, so let me, range let me just make an yeah. X for range selection. Um, so speed ramp to zero or from zero. But I never wanted to slow it down to zero. Right. I wanted to slow it down um, to 100%. I'm sorry, I wanted to slow it down to 5%. I so see. it keeps moving, not to zero. Right. Got and it. it gave these segments, but I, I really just didn't like it doing that way. So I thought, like in motion, I've got full control, because in motion you have Bezier curves. Sure. So I would bring these clips into motion and then play with that, but I didn't have a good sense of reference of how it was going to work with the cut when I was in motion. Okay. So I ended up just doing it in Final Cut, and I just did, you know, Full speed, or in this case, not quite, you know, or, or full down. 100% here means super slow motion. 100% right. is what the um, final playback is. So it's playing, um, even though it was shot at 480 frames a second, it's only playing back 24 frames a second. Right. So then you can, what the cool thing is, at that number, if you speed it up, you know, there's very specific speeds. Speeding up to 20x will exactly get you to real time. Right. Which is nice, because you, you are locked in in Final Cut to these two, four, eight, and 20 times. Uh, you can drag on the clip to do anything sure. you want, but 20 times the original will get us to exactly real time. So that made it kind of easy to do. Excellent. So, so that, that wasn't bad. Um, the funny thing about this camera is it shoots in um, bursts of eight seconds. So um, you can't just say, everybody have fun, and we're gonna, you know, we have two cameras, right. and we can just go around and shoot you, because you only have eight seconds. So we have to set each shot up, shot up, and then say action, press the shutter, get the action, and after eight seconds you're done, because it's writing it all to memory. Sure. And it has to, it has to buffer all that. So you have to kind of plan your shots a little bit. I think it's pretty amazing what you were able to achieve with that camera, I mean, it's just, it looks amazing. It's cool. It's it's a very it's a very fun camera, and anything that involves a lot of action, it's it's worth doing. And you can get these cameras on even on, on like borrowlenses.com for five hundred bucks for like a three day rental. But if you do a three day rental, that's a Thursday, Friday, Monday. You get it for you get it over the weekend. You get yeah. five days yeah. for five hundred bucks for this camera that does amazing things. So it's 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 pretty reasonable, yeah. and it'll take um it'll take your Canon lenses. No, that's great. Yeah, it'll, you can throw, shooting with your like camera? we shoot, we have 7Ds and we have a complement of Canon lenses, so we can put our own lenses on that thing. So we had a 70 to 200 on there, and a couple other things. We were shooting with Canon lenses. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's a fun, fun thing, and works really well. Final Cut. It was a fun project to do on a, on Final Cut Pro. That's sweet. Uh, so if you're watching, if you've got questions about what we're talking about here, about Final Cut, about production or post. 
Over there, you need to click the little sign in box. Sign in, post your question. We'll do our best to answer it. And uh, it is a dead night on the on the forum here. Clip exporter. I mean, that this is this is this is Alex. Even Alex isn't kicking in right now. So um, I know one thing is we didn't have a chance to promote the show until today, pretty much. <laughs> and, and we sort of we we did it at the last minute. So right. it's it, it's fine. So what? we're in, you know we're doing some good stuff. We did. Uh, we should probably mention a few things that we we talked about today because we did some good yeah. tips. Is there anything that I've got in here that you can? I mean, you did the still frame thing, but uh, let's see here. Well, this is our this is our Napa shoot, right? But this is just a few clips from the Napa shoot. Okay. So one of the things we talked about today that was kind of handy is uh, I'm gonna go ahead. You don't. We don't have an external drive hooked up, do we? No. No, I no, threw everything everything inside on this. Wow, you do really have a lot of projects. I know. Yeah. I just was trying to clean it up today. It's kind of embarrassing. I'm, I'm in project overload right now. Project event. You're looking at all my events right now, and the projects are even worse. Uh, the roommate project, you can talk a little about the audio components, maybe, if that's... Uh, yeah, let's talk a little bit about the audio components. There. We'll see if we've got a... Um, we should have in here, in the project library, under uh, Final Cut Projects Hold. Yeah. Open that up. There should be a roommate thing in there. Let's see. Yeah, we'll uh, look at uh, we'll look at uh, any one of these. Will probably get a little. We'll try and see. Let's take a look inside and see. Pay, pay All right. All right. So let me press the uh, home key. And um, so let's talk a little bit about audio components because it really is. In my in my opinion, it's one of the most important features that was in, that, that was introduced in Final Cut 10.06. Mm -hmm. The ability to actually get in and edit and adjust and change the pan, the levels, uh, copy and paste at, well, not copy and paste attributes, but work with the individual pieces of your audio. Because a lot of cameras now they shoot more than just one channel. They'll shoot you know two channels, four channels, some of them up to eight channels, and. Final Cut Pro, when you first put those clips in, will kind of hide all of that data from you. You can't see essentially what your um, You just your see one, is. one audio track. You, right now, well, you they, right. and it's really, these audio tracks are really a composite of all the channels. I mean, it's not like you're saying, well, what channel is that? Well, it's really kind of playing out a composite. Yeah, because that, that audio track that we see, in fact, you can you can expand audio, right? You can, you can. But uh, you'll only see, you're only seeing one, there's there. So would you just double click this? Just double click yeah, the and, audio. And, and but you can't tell that could be from several different mics right. going into that, and each mic could have multiple channels. Correct. Okay. So, but instead, if you hold down the Option key and double click on the waveform, you'll actually be able to expand and see all the channels. Wow. So now we've got a lot. We've got four separate channels. Right. So it looks only one has some well, yeah, uh, waveform in it. Not sure why we're not seeing the whole waveform, but uh, with the clip selected, um, in fact, you'll be able to go over to the uh, audio inspector and then spill these open, you'll be able to see that these are the four channels. I'm not really sure why we're not seeing audio content in these other channels because this- Because there was. There, well, yeah, there's yeah. actually audio content in all of them. Okay. But it's it's interesting. So anyway, the nice thing about the channels is you have all four. Let me, let me just try, um, let me try another clip here. Let me try um, this one here. Option double click. Yeah, for oh, some same reason- thing, the, just one channel in there. Not sure why, we're only seeing one channel. All right, so we'll just work with this. Um, the thing is like, okay, let's say you were given a file like this where you have like one audio channel and the, the other ones are empty for whatever reason. Uh, the, the, the beauty of this is you can actually go in here and you can then turn off the channels. Sure, ones you're not interested you're not, in. Or not gonna use. Yeah. And this is uh, actually what you, the thing is you wanna make sure that you select you want know, to make sure you You're select. Yeah, clip. I was on the other clip. That's one of another thing about Final Cut that you just got to be aware of. This thing of of I had this uh, the playhead was like way over here. Yeah, and you had that clip selected, and you move the playhead, but it didn't change the clip that's that right. was selected. So that's why it's I just get in the habit. It's kind of I'm having to retrain myself to like option, option click. click to move mm -hmm. the playhead over the clip and select it. What do you think about that new behavior where you have to option click to, to both move the playhead and select a clip now? I'm. It's okay. I, I wish there was an option for turning it off and reverting to the other way. So yeah. you can. My the, the perfect choice would be give me the choice of doing it either way. I, I'm generally like I'm generally finding uh. that I often want to 
select a clip without moving the playhead or vice versa, right. which I'm surprised. I didn't think. I didn't think I would like it, but I'm actually finding frequently that I, I end up using it in that way. I don't option click. Right. Uh, and then if I do... Uh, just want to move the playhead. You know, you can, you can always move the playhead because people click and it's like, hey, it didn't move the playhead. You know, click over here, didn't move the playhead. It's right. like, well, you can always click on the ruler to move the playhead. Right. But if you want to move it and select the clip, it's either two, two clicks. You know, click right. and select or, or option click. Right. So it does definitely take some getting used to. Yeah. So what I was saying is, uh, if I'm selecting the clip and I have these components that I'm not using, and I might as well just turn them off, which is huge. And there they are. So now I'm only seeing the audio component or channel that I'll be working with. And more importantly, you know, you can now choose, you can now export specific channels. Um, so if I could, I could, if I wanted, export that channel. I can export this channel. Uh, there's no content there. And um, I typically get in the habit of naming my channels. I, I'll just go ahead and call this, this uh, channel, Duncan, because that's who that is. And I love the fact that you can, um, when you name them, it's name there. Name there. Yep. And let's say I wanted to export all the channels with Duncan. Um, you can go to the modify menu, and when you go to, um, first of all, when you assign roles, because they're all just assigned roles by default. So if, if I select this clip, I just want you to see. Because Final Cut automatically gave it a role. Assigns, uh, a vid it's, because there's video to assign it, video and dialogue. That's the role. By right? default, that's by the default. roles that gave it. Okay. But, but, but sometimes you might want to export out you know, specific channels for uh, for creating split track masters or you're heading off to an audio sweetener and you want to just get, I want to give my audio guy only the track or only the component with where Duncan's talking, okay. you know, with a, where he's mic'd. Right. Okay. That's where the, what I'm about to show you is kind of important because then you can uh, then set up what are called sub roles. So um, if, I, if I go to the modify menu, you can choose uh, edit roles here or um, you can actually do it right here from this pop-up. Okay. Roles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now you're in the role. You're in the role editor, and if you see dialogue, it, which you can uh, you can assign as role by default. But I can actually go further and say I want to. You, you can. Can you change those roles too, or add new new like sort of top can, level roles? You can new? add audio roles. Okay. You create top level roles. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. But in this case, I'm just create, interested in creating a sub role for this particular thing. So I'm going to click. I'm going to type in here. Duncan, right? And so that's connected to the dialogue role. Right. It's a sub role of dialogue. Right. Okay. So now you can select that role or that component. Yeah. And under roles now, you'll see you can Duncan, now you right can there. see Duncan. You can assign it as a okay. sub role. So when you do finally export this out, and you can then, and of course in this case you're going to want to choose. Um, master file, and I don't see it in here. Maybe we got rid of it in some of our... All right, so really, it's <laughs> interesting, a little confusion here. An export file and a master file are really the same, the same thing. thing. So uh -huh. if I close that here. Maybe we restore like original... Well, I want you to see this, yeah. Um, you could do that, let's go back in here, let's let's restore. If you control so click on here control -click. And, and choose restore default, default destinations. destinations. Okay. It'll you get the big scary. Yeah. Do you want to do this? Yes. Okay. Now, now that probably just killed my Vimeo exports, my YouTube exports, and but I, that shouldn't be hard to set that up again. <laughs> do you have? But uh, that's okay. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> I keep forgetting this is not my computer. I'm treating as if it's my computer. If you um, trash your preferences, will it kill? Will it kill those? Are there? Do you know? I don't, no I don't know. Do. I just it's like that's all right. No problem. Back. No problem. It's easy to. It's, easy it's to do interesting again. though. The export file version here, this here, yeah, I, it is a little confusing to me. I, I get someone, I need to get someone to Apple to explain to me why it's called export file. If you look at these, oops, uh, if you look at the export file and the master file, yeah, you're going to bring it out there. And I just want them. you to see, yeah, you, look, look, they're really exactly they're really, the same thing. They're the same. Yeah, the thing. same set of options and everything. Well, yeah, look at that. So I'm. Maybe it's just a semantics thing, but it's a little bit confusing why they're not using, you know, the same terminology. I guess the master file refers to you're sending out the master components from your project. Yeah. You know, where export is like more generic. Or, or maybe guess. it's like master file. We're assuming you're not going to touch anything here, and it's going to export everything perfectly the way it was. And export file is kind of like a version of this that you can tailor to your choices, even right. though you could do it with the master file. Right. That you wouldn't want to, because then it's not really a master file sure. anymore. Right. So it's it's interesting. So I can pull this out, or you can, uh, you can control click. You can say uh, you can pull that out of there. 
you know, so I got my master file back in here. But important, the, the important point of a master file is that it's going to export all your content out at the highest possible quality. Right. So if you're cutting in this in this sequence, we're cutting with whatever Apple ProRes. It's going to export Apple ProRes. Yeah. So if we're cutting with uh, AIFF for 14, 16 bit, 48 kilohertz, that's what's going to be exported. It's the highest possible quality. So, like you were mentioning today, you wouldn't be using this for you know the web or iDevice. This is mainly for yes. handing off to somebody they can continue. Yeah. Or you're archiving. You want to you want like a final archived version to of, put away, your, yeah, to of put the away. final final show That's that right. you can press again later. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you see this resolution is 960, and it's a little bit smaller resolution only because. Is it anamorphic we, or something? Well, no, the, the deal is we include oh, this training. Yeah, training we, okay. Yeah. Got it. So here's the thing. Um, under roles, this is where you want to say, you know, you can set you can set your roles. And in this case, video not, but we're going to just set, I'm going to just choose audio, audio right, only. Right, because that's what we're trying to do here. Right. And then roles, um, you could say audio roles as separate files, right? Right. And, and by the way, audio format is not right. You don't want an AAC. That's a highly compressed file. You want to choose either AIF or, or wave. wave. Okay. Okay. Now, then you're going to go down and choose audio roles as separate, separate files. files. Oh, and you get a whole new area you here. Get a whole new area. And this is important to understand. Everything that's tagged, as a, every clip that's tagged as dialogue will come out as a separate file. But it's it's going to be all mixed together. It's everything that's tagged. So all of the channels that have dialogue Every single all, one of those dialogue will yeah. be mixed together to yeah. one file. And it'll file. come out as a surround file, but you can override and say, I want a stereo version or, or mono. Okay. Right, or mono. But really, that's what you really want to do if you want a separate file of that one component, but we tagged as Duncan earlier, yep. you want to choose add audio files, and then you'll notice um, there's Duncan right you there. You can choose him right there. Right, and then if he's not there, I'm going to choose a mono version there. So when I export, I'll get two separate files. Two totally separate so files, totally. one with everything tagged dialogue, uh -huh. dialogue, and one with only those things that are tagged Duncan, which in your case, you only tagged one right. of his clips, but you could have Gone selected them all. all. And in fact, a fast way to select them all may be because you can turn everything on and off. You could turn off everything but Duncan, he would only see his audio components down there. That's right. And then you and could select them and then assign boom, them. done. Never thought of it. That's that's the way you would a do it. Super you. fast way, right? Yeah, that would be yeah. a fast way it's to flexible. do it. Flexible. It's a very, very flexible. It's very, very cool. Now I have a, one question on this related well, to another way. Go ahead, oh, okay, no, 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 finish no, 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 your no, thought. You first, you first. I was thinking I'm you, also have the, you also have the timeline index too that will uh, reveal and hide different. Like, yeah, sure. Why don't you show that? Because not everybody might be aware of the timeline index, and well, it's very you, quite powerful. Well, if you go to the timeline index, and so you click the it, little button down here, yeah, Shift Command Two. Yeah, Shift Command Two. Click this little little button here, and then you get your roles here, and then you can. Can you zoom in a little closer so that? Command option on since so, yeah. so you can see here it's saying we have the dialogue and then you have, you have, you could see what things are assigned already as roles so yes. other dialogue and Duncan so if happen. you just if you just click on Duncan it'll so if you just click on Duncan over here in the right. timeline index it'll well, highlight what, him what right this will do it'll highlight I'll say but that's it, what's it, already that's already been tagged yeah. So you know role. it's tagged, but it won't actually select it. It doesn't make no, a selection out of it. It's not about, see, this This isn't really about selecting things. It's yeah. about helping you identify what components have been yes. tagged. So it's a kind of a quick way, oh, okay, I can see it. All of these all of these clips have been properly uh, roll tagged. Identified, right. Identified. It's, it's a way of checking, yeah. Right. And then if you just choose uh, see a dialogue, you'll see almost everything highlights because yeah. we have. I haven't been explicit in going through and setting up my roles. Now, th there's something about roles that... I, I'm not, I mean, you could certainly go through your, your project and go through and assign everything roles, but that's just, it's a lot of work. I think it's better yeah. if you know what you're going to do at the end time is at this this stage when you're bringing stuff before in. You before you start editing. You start assigning, you know, you can assign your roles. Like, for example, I know I can go through here and I can I can see the shots with Duncan in it. So, so if, you, but if you select that, are you able to see all the separate uh, channels if you go to the audio yeah, inspector? Yeah. So you're signing it to, but you're signing that to the entire. You're signing that to all the channels that's connected that's to that correct. clip. That's right. Is that what you want to do? Well, I, that, I mean, my, I might, might want to do that. But if, but if you went to audio, would you be able to see the separate ones? Like if you go in, the, if you go to the audio inspector. No, it's can still we see if you spill that open. Are you able to then just select one of the, you know, the one mic that is his mic and assign that? 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Mm, don't think it works that way. Okay. Um, okay. I, I think what you do is I got, okay. is that you you would just you're globally assigning a role to, to everything that clip. to that clip. Okay. And then if you need an indiv- you need another component within that clip assigned a different role, you'll have to assign it. Yeah, and you have to do it when it's in the timeline. Correct. Okay. Yeah. There's no way to assign a role okay. uh, to an, to in an here. Individual audio component. Right. And, 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 and you know it's it really depends on what your workflow is. I'm, yeah. I'm You know again if you have basically a one shot, two shot, one shot, two shot, when there's no one else, it might be quicker to just pre-assign it a role. Yes. And that way, it's going to make it easier to export. You don't have to, go, you don't have to worry about go through here and assi- make sure yes. what clips are assigned, yeah. which roles, and which ones aren't. Because there's a shot of him that's going to be... Yeah. So, yeah. So okay. this is this is very handy. And then you can then collapse. What's nice is you can then collapse the ones that you've uh, already... Um, yeah. And sometimes the collapsing doesn't do very much, depending on what your view yeah, is. Yeah, but it just kind of hides a waveform. Yeah. I've noticed that's that. that hides away from it. it's yeah. kind of strange. Okay, so that's oh, and the other thing you got to remember to click in the gray area. Otherwise, a lot of people are like, why is that highlighted? Yeah, and they close that. It's like it's well, still I, highlighted. It's still highlighted. Yeah, and you just how why? And you can't get rid of it unless you go back into the timeline you, index. You have to go in here and then click right off below. there, and that's yes. that's a big gotcha yeah. for people. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, you know, one thing related to that. If you have some compressor presets, yeah. will those show up in this share destinations? Um, do you have access to them? Like if you click that share button, is there a way to We're get to We're trying to coax Alex Holner out of his uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Out of his hole, yeah, get him out of bed. It's right. 3 o'clock right. in the morning. So, <laughs> you knew exactly where I, I was did. going with that. I did. So, <laughs> you read me like a book. So our friend Alex, um, had mentioned in, I think, one of his blogs or... Whatever, yeah, in a blog post just, just that, this week. That you can actually set up compressor presets, share them, and people using Final Cut don't even have to have compressor, and those compressor presets will work, is essentially... Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. But if we back up, I just, wanted, right. I just wanted, and I honestly don't remember, from here, can, can you add a destination that is a compressor preset? These are, that's what this is, compressor preset. Duh, compressor so you just drag, right there. drag yeah. it in there, and yeah. there's your compressor. And then, and then it opens and shows, okay. Now, here's, here's the thing, that, yeah, it opens and shows what custom presets yeah. are, are, are in there. But even if you don't have, my understanding is what he talked about, even if you don't own compressor, which 50 bucks, you're probably gonna want, yeah. but if you don't own it, and if somebody gives you these files, and you stick them in the right folder, they'll work for you. Right. Because the, the compressor engine is built into Final Cut Pro. That's right, it is. So the question is, and we haven't tested this out, uh, where, let's say someone emails you, let's say this file right here, Yeah. where do you put it? So he, yeah. he posted that okay. of, of exactly where it is. So I don't want to go dig around in there All now. Right, but, but the point is, is that it works. You don't need compressor. Yeah. That's actually pretty cool. It is pretty cool, because if you've got some specific setting and you're working with other editors, like use this one, like I don't have compressor. It's like, it doesn't matter, dude. Just put it in this folder. You actually have to create, it within a folder, you have to create another folder name, but stick it in there and it will work right. for you, which is pretty nice. Because you and I, we share, you know, we live in different right. states and we share these things all the time. Right. Absolutely. I mean, they're, they're good. I mean, I, I still get questions, well, why, why use compressor? I, when I can do bundles, I can do th- the sorts of compressor-like yeah. uh, workflows within Final Cut 10, what do I need compressor for? Well, well, a couple things. One is that there's, there's a, you can get a lot more specific and granular with your presets. You can do things with keyframes, and you could set up uh, markers. You, if marker, you didn't I mean, there's just mm-hmm. a ton of stuff that you can do in compressor. Gamma. Tons, mm-hmm. watermarks, mm-hmm. The, the whole bunch of stuff that you couldn't do directly in uh, in Final Cut. So compressor definitely is useful. Yep. Um, you know, it's 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 you know whether you need it or not is up to you. But right, I, I right. find that it's since you're if you're making quick time movies for people, why not have yeah? Have it compressor. just gives you that much more power and flexibility. Right, and you can get it when you need it. I mean, this the the whole vehicle, the App Store, makes it so easy to. Um, just get the stuff when you need it. Right. And actually, while we mention that, one, one more thing I'd like to mention before, maybe before we close up today, is that, you know, this week, uh, version 10.0.7 shipped. Right. And uh, it was a minor bug fix update for sure. the most part. Fixed a few things. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I did what I usually don't do. I just went and updated. Boom, just did it right away. I didn't, oh, it's a minor question. update, just put in, yeah. And I was fine, uh-huh. but, you know, Apple doesn't recommend that. Um, when you're as right a, in the middle of a practice. project, yeah. When you're in the middle of a project, which when are you not in the middle of a project? Exactly. I mean, but I wanted to show everybody there is an Apple uh, document 
This is good. I'm glad you're bringing this, this up. This is kind of important, yeah. So it's a Final Cut Pro 10 best practices for updating document. And you can, let me zoom in just so you can see the, the URL up here. You can always email Steve or, or I or Twitter us at Ripple Training and we'll, yeah. we'll send this out. But this basically tells you a process to go through before you update. Instead of just going to the App Store and saying, yeah, and download, the first thing they recommend you doing is basically taking your existing Final Cut Pro. Zipping it. And zipping it. Right. Yeah, throw it in a folder, zip it, and then also take your projects and events and make backup copies of those just in case. Yeah. And that's the pain in the butt. The projects aren't yeah. so big, but making backups of all your events. Oh my gosh. We got like, you know. Especially if you were in a habit 20, of importing media, you know, so they actually take media. The right. folder. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's, that's kind of nuts because you will find, even with 10.0.7, when it opens to 10.0.6, actually 10.0.7 and 6 actually let, seem to let you go back and forth. They, you know, bug fixes often let you do that. But when there's a major change, it'll say, hey, I need to update these events. You're not gonna be able to go back. You're right. In this case, you could go back. But the safest thing to do, honestly, is is keep an old copy of Final Cut, the previous version of Final Cut around, and ideally your events and projects too. Okay. Honestly, I, I think at least keeping the old version of Final Cut itself is really easy. Sure. And um, the events, you can kind of on a case by case, like open up one of your events, you're not too worried about it, let it update, test things out, okay, it looks okay, maybe I'll do right. the next one. Right. It, it seems to work okay. Well, speaking of, and we're gonna wrap up here soon, but speaking of housekeeping, our, you know, one of our friends, um, told us about, you know, some preferences that, you know, we want to, you know, there are occasions. Oh, yes, yes. Now, there's our occasions to t still trash preferences. You know, it's like, well, gosh, I thought we... I thought we were past that. I thought we were past that. Didn't we do that in OS 9? And, yeah. You know, whatever, Final Cut 7. Well, there are occasions where trashing preferences does make a yeah. huge, huge difference. And, you know, I, I found the trashing preferences when when, I, when I'm starting to get some beach balls and the app just feels slower or whatever, yeah. I found that trashing preferences does, uh, it, does it, fix It does. Things. It seems to fix things if things are acting a little wonky. And in, in, in Mountain Lion, you know, if you go to the Go menu, you don't see the library. Right. But if you add the option key, and if you could, yeah, thank you, bring up the screen there. If you press Go, you don't see the, if you press the option key, it adds the library there. Right. So that's a quick way to get to the library. Yeah. It kind of hides it's it from the you. the library in Petaluma, same one. <laughs> it looks like the library yeah, in Petaluma. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, then, and then from there, what we want to do is go down to uh, Preferences, and then uh, here they are. So it's com, I'm going to highlight them all, com.apple.finalcutpro. Blah, 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 com.apple.fonica.com.apple, .com .apple. no, not that one. There's actually usually five really? altogether. Do I have them alphabetical? Because I deleted them recently and it might not have reconstituted all of no, them. I don't think it did, but there are five of them. There's normally five, and you can delete, and you should delete all five. I, all five right? of them, yeah. You will lose if you set preferences in Final Cut. Let's just make clear what's going to happen. I mean, it's not a huge thing, but if you go to preferences in Final Cut, if you've made changes to any of these windows, that's I don't know if you'll lose your destinations, right. your yeah, custom destinations, yeah. but if you go like to editing and you've changed your yeah. your still duration, um, your transition duration, the they'll be back to defaults. So these things will go back to defaults. And it's important to realize that because there's things on import, like you might have chosen to import, you know, create optimized uh, media, and then it's not going to do it anymore. Right. So if you trash preferences, you want to look through your preferences and set those up the way you want. Sure. But it can make a difference. I've yeah. definitely seen it made a difference as well. So yeah. All right. Well, um, I think that was some good information. It was. We it had did. a nice time. We did. Um, I hope if you joined us, you had a nice time, even though we didn't really hear from many of you this time. That's OK. Uh, maybe next time. Uh, and thank you for watching us. And we'll be back probably in the February time frame for the next live version. Yeah. But we'll have a regular weekly show is available at uh, on iTunes at MacBreak Studio. Just look up MacBreak Studio on iTunes. Where else can you find it? On the Pixel Core site? Yeah, Pixel Core. PixelCore.com. Let me, let me bring up. I do have uh, a link that kind of shows all of our site, uh, all of our shows. But actually, if you just go to RippleTraining.com, there's a link there for all of our shows yeah, at, at a, the top. Yeah, there's if you click um, free stuff, free stuff, free stuff. A free stuff tab, we're cataloging all of the all the shows, uh, all the shows on there. there. You can get to links to all the shows. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at Ripple Training. Uh, we're on Facebook too. There's a page yeah. for Ripple yeah. Training. So uh, again, thanks for watching, mm -hmm. and uh, check us out MacBreak Studio. Write us with any questions you have. MacBreak Studio, Final Cut Pro, whatever. And uh, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Kwanzaa. Happy holidays. And we'll see you guys in the new year.